welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author as an EWTN host, Father Jeffrey Kirby, STD. Manual for Suffering is the title of this book, published by TAN Publications, and of course available through our EWTN religious catalog, EWTNRC.com, all things Catholic. Always good to see you, Thanks, Doug. Father Kirby. People have seen you on the network over a number of years. You've done uh, different programs for us. Recently, uh, we actually taped a new set of programs at the end of last year. Uh, that haven't aired yet. Why don't you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, I was very excited about this. It's called uh, The Christian Way, and it uh, applies the gospel to current issues. So mm -hmm. things that people might have to address in the midst of their workplaces or neighborhoods, things such as immigration or the LGBTQ movement or mm -hmm. all these various cultural things. How as Christians can we approach them? What is the Christian way? How can we speak the truth in love? Right. So the series kind of walks through these different issues. Right. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, the title of this is Manual for Suffering. Uh, why do we need a manual for suffering? Is this to teach us how to suffer better or right, what? Right, right. Who wants a manual for suffering, right? right? right. Yes. So the, the book actually addresses the real suffering that, that we just have in a fallen world. We know that the world's fallen, there's suffering, there's evil, uh, we, we have heartache, we have uh, ailments. So it just walks through our traditional theology of suffering that, that's drawn from the sacred scriptures also retrieves the beautiful spiritual act of redemptive suffering that, we, that we've kind of lost in the church today. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, it presents a lot of the prayers and novenas from the spiritual treasury. So it's meant to be an accompaniment, a help, a resource as we suffer. So. Well, let me ask you, the style of the book looks like, you know, the old-style missal or kind of a prayer book, uh, I don't want to say pre-Vatican II, but stylistically a little bit like that. And Tan obviously was famous for republishing, mm. uh, you know, classic books over the years anyway, so they're, they're good at this style. Is there a reason you decided on this style? Was that your choice, their choice? It, it was their choice, but I was, I was right there with them thinking mm. it was great because the style of the book shows we want you to beat this up. Mm -hmm. We want this book to, to just be with you in the trenches. We want it in the consoles of cars and purses and back pockets. Like, this isn't just a book to be read and put on the shelf. It's, it's meant to, to be with us. To be carried with us. you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Beat Take up. it into Absolutely. adoration or anything else. Who's uh, Marianne Murvac? Yes. Oh, Marianne is this wonderful woman in my parish who has such a tremendous love for the sick, the suffering. A woman who really pours out her life in service to others. So it was an honor to dedicate the manual to her. You talk about how to use this particular manual in, a, in kind of a format. You say the first part lays out the biblical theological foundations for suffering the world's fallenness. The second part offers who suffer a scriptural test and the purpose of this manual is to help those who suffer find meaning, purpose, and value of suffering in Jesus Christ. And you mm -hmm. say it's intended for personal use. One of the things you, you kind of jumped ahead and you talk about later in this is redemptive suffering, which, which yes. from my perspective, I always thought was one of the greatest insights of the Catholic Church, which is because it's true. But it's, it's clearly something that's totally countercultural today, the idea that, well, you can take your suffering and use it for something. Yes. They say, well, you're, you're, you're like a sadist or a masochist <laughs> when you say stuff like that. Right, right, or, or, or the, uh, even the, the contemporary response as well is, um, to use your suffering to justify self-victimization or self-pity, mm -hmm. you're kind of wallowing in this cesspool of, of dark spirits. And, and, and in spite of that, in, in contrast to that, mm -hmm. as Christians we have redemptive suffering, which means when suffering comes, and it will in a fallen world, one way or another, or multiple different ways, even, though, even sometimes at the same time, that in the midst of that, that our suffering has power when it's mm -hmm. united with Jesus Christ. So it's an act of faith, it's an act of hope, and it allows our suffering to not have the last word. Right. That we unite with Christ and actually brings about good. So suffering is an evil, but by the grace of God, the, the saving work of Jesus Christ, it becomes a good. Right. That, that gives us great hope as Christians. Now, you, you mentioned it, you say it right in the beginning, while life is good, we know that it is fallen. Uh, do we know it's fallen? It, uh, do, does everybody today agree that the world is fallen, or is it uh, just that... Uh, you know, people are basically good. Uh, in fact, they're based, they are good. And then mm. it's structures and society that make people bad. Uh -huh. So if we just fix the structures, yeah. if we teach kids better from K through whatever to, to be tolerant of everybody, uh, we'll all be fine. Right, right. Now, I, I, since you asked that question, Doug, and I want to say, well, anyone who has eyes can just see reality. Mm -hmm. but. I guess you become very good with diluting reality uh, in our world. Or explaining I, it away. Explaining it away or redefining it, forcing it with legislation to people to accept and so on. But I, I would say this, that in the human heart, 
when there's real fallenness, in, in spite of all the ideologies and our attempts at, at mm -hmm. self-improvement of, of the world, that in our hearts, when we really endure suffering, heartbreaking suffering, we can look and say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. you know, and and, and be, even be willing to acknowledge that our efforts to fix this just sometimes seem to make it worse or don't work. You know, that, that radical moment of truth. So I think it's in the human heart to have the capacity to realize, I know this is good, and I know this is fallen. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it takes a person a while to get there. Right. Uh, suffering can be a harsh teacher at times. But we know as Christians this truth. But I think any human person who has some relative honesty with themselves can begin to realize, I know this is not supposed to be this way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes though, we don't even ask why we have that realization, mm -hmm. right? Some could just say, yeah, life stinks and that's just the way it's going to be. But there is this inherent hope in our hearts as a children of God mm -hmm. made in his image that when we have that honesty, however we eventually get there, right. that we know this is good and we know it's fallen. That it, it's not supposed to be, be this, this broken or this difficult or this hard or there's, this suffering isn't supposed to be here. Right, and, and, you, and, that, and that there's something missing that we need to be able to deal with that Amen. in our lives. Now, you have a story right at the beginning. It's a typical story uh, where a woman says to you, please explain why God would let my mother suffer like this. Yes. You know, yes. and, pe and you say, we all, we all ask the questions in one way or another. Why do we suffer? Why do our loved ones suffer? Why is there suffering at all? And then, you know, people say, well, you pray. Well, I prayed and, and my mother still suffered. And yes. She wasn't healed, so why? Why, why, why yes. does she have to suffer? Why do we have to suffer seeing her suffer? Yes, yes. So the, the whole first part of the manual that, that you're quoting from is a theology of, of suffering drawn from the scriptures. And as you indicate, I try to make this teaching digestible. So this isn't high developed theology. It, it, it's broken down. I try to give these pastoral stories so people can understand. And, mm -hmm. and the story you're quoting is uh, a woman is dying in this her adult son is asking, why is mom suffering? And, right. and, and to, to pose that question, why is there suffering? Suffering is permitted by God so that greater good can come from it. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we would say, from Christian revelation, suffering is for our good in order to work out our salvation in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, as Christians, we can understand that in a certain context. When we begin to speak to a pluralistic world, sometimes you have to use a different language right. or a different approach. But I think first, let's retrieve it in, right. within the household of faith that suffering is an evil but is made good right. by the saving work of Jesus Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection. We have the capacity as baptized Christians to allow good to be brought forth from that. Right. When the Lord brought about our redemption, he chose the path of suffering. Right, that, that, right. And so the we Abruzis cannot be saved. Absolutely, about, right? we cannot be saved or love or seek to do the work of the Lord if we're going to try to avoid suffering. Right, because obviously he didn't. Right. So if he yes. didn't, well, why would we expect to be different from us? You, you also talk about making some distinctions between the three major types of evil in our fallen world. Suffering caused by natural evils. What's a natural yes. evil? So hurricanes, uh, a pandemic would be an example of something that cannot be directly the effect of the actual sin of a person. Okay. Suffering inflicted by moral evil. Yes. This is the easier one to explain. Mm -hmm. So that when I was bringing everything together in terms of this manual. Uh, first, you know, due diligence, I looked, did someone else write something like this? Right. And as I looked at the popular books right now on suffering, especially in the Christian tradition, it's almost extensively on moral evil. Mm -hmm. Because it's easier, not necessarily easy, but easier to explain moral suffering, abuse of freedom, people do bad things. That's a lot easier to explain than a natural evil. Or, as we but probably address the, the third, right. uh, the universal evils. Right. So the moral evil gets a lot of attention, much more than the other two. But the moral evil is when we abuse our freedom, we take advantage of the talents and gifts that God has given to us. We use the very structures that we've created to help people to take advantage of them. Right. So these moral evils are a lot easier to explain. Horrific, terrible, but we have a greater understanding of how that happens. Well, the third type of suffering consists of universal acts of destruction or desecration. These include, in part, the horrors of war, as we are speaking, that's going on, killing fields, concentration camps, nuclear bombs, and networks on human trafficking. Why isn't that just an extension of a moral evil, or is it? Yes, yeah, so our moral tradition gives this third distinction because it's, it's an evil that is so universal mm -hmm. that as an individual, I have no power or control. I didn't cause it. I didn't bring about its cause. So it's a universal evil that 
I am as vulnerable or as much the recipient of its suffering as any other person. You, you talk about in the chapter our, our original goodness. By seeking to take the divine nature upon themselves, Adam and Eve tried to force the divine nature into our human nature. It was a foolish act as a horse trying to steal human nature for itself. Yes, yeah. So, so in our Christian tradition, it, it's great as, as, as believers because we have these answers that are given to us by divine wisdom. So we know that before the fall, Adam and Eve, like our human nature was beautiful. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people don't realize before the fall, we were never supposed to get sick and we were never supposed to die. Mm -hmm. We had sanctifying gra grace. We had fr a friendship with God. Our bodies shared in the immortality of our souls. There was a harmony between body and soul. And we know that there was infused knowledge. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to learn things or remember. We just had all these beautiful gifts. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine it was as if we had a magnificent temple and everything was ornate and beautiful and, and just splendorous. And someone threw a grenade into that temple. Mm -hmm. And the, t the temple wall sustained the blast, but everything inside the temple was thrown into disarray. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to our human nature with the fall. And so with the fall, this, this, our human nature is now all over the place. And, and what God wanted to give us has been taken away. And what we have in terms of our human nature, now we have just this discord. And, that, and creation shares in that. Because right. we, as human beings, we, we're the crown of creation. So it all participates in this kind of discord and right. disunity. You say our ability to believe and discern moral goodness through the natural light of reason has become more difficult and strenuous. Our fallenness has clouded our capacity for moral discernment and darkened our ability to acknowledge moral truth. Oh my goodness, and it's getting worse and worse as, as the West more and more abandons its Christian foundation. Uh, we are finding more of that confusion over good and evil. Uh, I think that, you know, one popular quote says, a, a dark age is not when the lights go out, but when the lights go out, no one notices. Mm -hmm. And it concerns me as I look at our society because we're calling good evil and evil good. Good people are being persecuted and even people, evil people are being exalted. Right. And that comes from this fallenness that we, be, it, it's, it, our fallenness when it, when it, when it's indulged, it causes this confusion. You say, uh, you have a quote here for Pope uh, St. John Paul II in his uh, apostolic letter having to do with suffering. Man suffers on account of evil, which is a certain lack, limitation, or distortion of good. We could say that man suffers because of good in which he does not share, from which in a certain sense he is cut off, of which he has deprived himself. He particularly suffers when he ought in the normal order of things to have a share in the good and does not have yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, so I always appreciate John Paul II because he can say uh, almost the same thing in five different ways. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, um, but ultimately what, what he's saying in that quote, drawing from other parts of our tradition, is that evil is a privation. It, it takes what, it, what doesn't belong to it. So we are called to, to have this abundant life. We're called to have uh, this, the, these virtues and, and, and this harmony within us. Uh, sin takes all that away from mm -hmm. us. And, and then with that sin, there's a suffering. So whether it's original sin of our first parents or our actual sins uh, through life, it, it, it robs us. It's a thief. Mm -hmm. Sin is a thief. Now you talk about here, in a sense you're talking about hope against hope, and then you explain it to some degree almost like we have a little bit of a misunderstanding today of, of hope. You say hope is not a trust in our own powers, abilities, or capacities to change things or make them better or to make them into what we want them to be. This type of understanding is more akin to that of the Greek mindset and the pagan approach. Yes. What's yes. our approach to hope? Yes, yeah, so our approach is uh, not a trust or confidence in ourselves or our own strengths uh, that would almost border on foolishness. But the theological and, and the clear understanding of, of hope is that we trust in God, divine providence, that, that God's care for us, that I can't change this, I can't fix this world. Uh, I can have confidence and become an instrument of God who can. So theological hope, uh, true hope, directs us to God, out of ourselves, out of our own head, allows us to surrender our talents to a greater good. So this whole notion mm -hmm. of providence, grace, and hope uh, we've really lost those, not just in our society, mm -hmm. but even among believers. I mean, we have believers who don't understand what hope is, or divine providence, or the workings of grace. Mm -hmm. Doug, when we start to lose that, then uh, ultimately we are dooming ourselves to misery. Mm -hmm. And the belief that we have no power as Christian disciples to change the evil they're suffering in our world, and that's a lie. In a section here, uh, chapter four, you, uh, about fully human, you were talking to a Christian uh, therapist, I believe, and he said, he indicated that the therapeutic community speaks of disorders, but it never formally gives a description of a, quote, ordered life. 
How can someone have a disorder when no order is clearly given? Amen. Why did you want to put that out? I had to put that in there. I, I, you, you speak to uh, Christian therapists and, and, and really just therapists in general who, who are beginning to ask more and more of the questions, how can we speak of disorder disorders when we have not explained what an ordered life looks like? So, for example, a lot of times now there's a push in a lot of um, therapeutic associations mm -hmm. for some type of development of virtue. Mm -hmm. What is a human being supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Now, this is interesting because it really un unmasks positivist therapy and, and, and psychiatry, believing that there's no uh, anthropology, no structure to human nature, mm -hmm. because now suddenly what we see is, well, everything becomes a disorder. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, you don't like that? You want to be something else? Or, you know, oh, well, that makes you uncomfortable? Well, that's a disorder. Don't worry about it. It's not your fault. Don't right. want to take these meds right. or do this no and you'll be okay. Right. right. But suddenly when there's a, a developed concept of virtue and what an ordered life looks like, suddenly even the therapeutic community is kept in check. Well, in the section on, on sin is a privation, um, there was an interesting story you hear about a young man who asked a question about somebody who had survived a concentration camp. Yes. Uh, and he, he and he had asked the survivor, you know, about uh, did he feel like did he question God in his life? And he paused. He said, "Make me question my belief in God." No, he didn't open up Auschwitz. Men did that. I never questioned my faith in God. He's the one who got me through it. No, Auschwitz made me question my belief in man. In man. And so, is the problem today to some degree? We're, we're, we've moved onto this idea of uh, man as being. But we'll, we'll trust in man. Yeah. We'll figure this out. We have lost a healthy distrust of ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and just realizing the fallenness that even just mere observation can show us in, in the midst of the world. I, and I put that story in there because I remember it was with a high school group that we took to Poland. And when the gentleman said that, I, I was just shocked. If, if I can add, uh, it's not in the book, but mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman would tell him, was, was explained to us that he actually worked in the office in, in Auschwitz. He survived because he could speak Polish, Russian, and German. Mm -hmm. So he was there keeping the records. And so, of course, one of the young men asked, do you remember Father Maximilian Kolbe? Mm -hmm. right? And he said, no, no, I, I was in the office doing the books. I remember when the uh, friars were brought in and mm -hmm. they you know, stripped them and shaved them and humiliated them. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't, I didn't know him, but I remember the day he died. Mm -hmm. He said, I remember the day he died because when the story got out of what he had done, taking the life of another prisoner, it gave hope in mm -hmm. Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. It was the only day in that place of hell we had hope. It goes, he thought that the SS had invented the story to create that false hope. Oh, really? Then to mock the people who believed it. And later when he found out, no, it was really true, this Catholic priest had done it, he said, we found hope for one day in a living hell on earth. And of course that hope came from a Christian who believed in the saving power of Jesus Christ. You have a quote here from Pope St. John Paul II as well, uh, frequently taught, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures, we are the sum of the Father's love for us and our real capacity to become the image of the Son. That's what gives us hope. Right? Absolutely. And in our fallenness, we always want to believe that we're orphans, that God's a, a master who's out to, to get us or hurt us. Uh, the Catechism speaks of the caricatures of God that we create because of our fallenness. And that also is involved in our own identity. We say, no, I'm, I'm just a sum total of the worst things I've ever done in my life. I'm just a sum total of that. And that's a lie. That's a, 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 a consequence as well of our fall that we're willing to change who God is and we change who we are mm -hmm. thinking that we are really that evil. No, we're the children of God. We are made good. God wants to save us by his grace. Right. And we have a higher dignity we can ever imagine. In the section right uh, around redemptive suffering, chapter 5, you say, but if Jesus Christ has destroyed sin, does illness and suffering still afflict humanity? Why does it? How is humanity to understand suffering in light of the ministry of Jesus Christ? That's a question a lot of people have. Yes. And say, yes. well, he overcame all this stuff, so why is it still here? Yes, amen. Why are the consequences of sin still here if he has removed sin? And of course, uh, the Lord himself gives us the answer. He tells us if, you, if we want to be saved, if we want to be worthy of him, we must be willing to die to ourselves and take up our cross. Mm -hmm. So the Lord allowed the consequences of sin, the suffering and the hardship of the world to be here mm -hmm. in order that we might be willing to walk with him and by his grace in the midst of this suffering fallen world right. to work out our salvation. Paul speaks about this, St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians, in fear and trembling, I work out my salvation. So if we want to be saved, we have to allow grace to really enter into our souls and, and conquer 
-hmm. all of those dark spirits, self-pity, entitlement, uh, bitterness, and so on, and really unite ourselves through suffering uh, to the Lord Jesus. If I can just mention, we talk about the fall. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of salvation history, when the fall happened, God gave us a promise of a Savior. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's like a woman's going to come, her offspring will crush the head of the serpent. But we oftentimes forget the fourth part of that, which is the serpent will strike at his heel. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, first promise of a Savior, we are told that salvation will come through suffering. Right. So we who choose to follow the way of the Lord Jesus are willing to accept his suffering. I guess we're the heels, so <laughs> to speak, sometimes in this. Uh, and you also talk about, and I thought this, I have to say, as a New Yorker, you brought up uh, Cardinal John O'Connor, uh, yes. who was uh, was a larger than life, as you say here, uh, person. <laughs> and I, I had the privilege of seeing him a couple of times. And he talked about suffering, and at the end of his life, I mean, he, his face was, uh, he was yeah. swelled up, and he had the cancer. He said, it's all part of this life, and there's nothing worse in the world than wasted suffering. Amen. How would a person waste their suffering in your mind? Yes, yes. So wasted suffering is to go through the sufferings of this life and to let them have the last word, mm -hmm. to let the sufferings be an end in themselves that have, has only led our souls, our hearts to uh, misery, disillusionment, and, and meaninglessness. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the path given to us. Like right. In the Lord Jesus, we have the opportunity to unite our sufferings with His, and it becomes a saving act for ourselves and to others. I'm always very moved at Mass when I ask the faithful to pray and, they were, and, and, the, and the response, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of His name for our good and the good of all His Holy Church. Mm -hmm. That is a liturgical act of redemptive suffering. Right. I'm giving you what I got, Lord. I know it's supposed to be better. I want you to give, to give you more, but this is what I have this week. And I'm, just, I'm giving it to you because I want to praise you and glorify you. And I want you to save my soul and save everyone else that's here. Right? That, that is redemptive suffering. And we right. see it reflected even in the Mass. Now, you, the other name you bring up here is Malcolm Mugridge, famous yeah. for, of, of course, of his involvement with Mother Teresa and becoming a major convert. And, and he said here, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness, whether pursued or attained. Yes, yes. I think he, he had such an ability. I wanted to put that from one of his essays. Right. He had such an, a way of expressing realities and suffering in particular that, you know, he goes on in that same essay to talk about how suffering is a teacher and, and whether we're pursuing or whether it's given to us, uh, it becomes, it can be a means of, of growth, of salvation, of coming to encounter God. And one of the things that Malcolm Ungridge was involved with, was, which was actually years ago uh, exposing the Soviet Union's yes. abuse of Ukraine. Yes. Uh, and he was one of the ones who, who brought the, the starvation and what they had done during Stalin. And we forget. Like, it's interesting how we yeah. have to relearn these uh, right. realities in this history. Right. Uh, you go through in uh, the second part of the book, you basically talk about AIDS in the midst of suffering, and you, you, you start off with the Bible on suffering, etc., and then you have the Gospels, and you say, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Now, that's what our Lord said, but we, I think we say it, but we don't mean it. Right. It, it's very difficult to live in the sacrament of the present moment, as our uh, theological tradition calls it. And, and I try to encourage those, especially those who are in great suffering, um, perhaps those who are e even terminally ill to, to, that, that are dying and so on. I, I try to stress to them, if you think about the future or what's tomorrow, it's going to scare you because the grace you need hasn't been given yet I for see. tomorrow. Okay. So the grace you need is here. So if we keep thinking about the future, we're just going to scare ourselves because the grace of God that we need isn't there. So we're just going to overwhelm ourselves. So it is difficult. We're all called to kind of this spiritual discipline to, to try as best right. we can to focus on today. Jumping ahead, chapter 9, um, you talk about uh, the devil takes advantage of an anxious and sad soul. You say, oppose any tendency to sadness and melancholy. Although that may seem as if everything you do is cold, sluggish, and sad, you must persevere. By means of sorrow, the devil tries to make us weary of good works. If he sees that we do not stop our good works but go on meritoriously persevering, he'll cease his attacks. Amen. It's true. It's true. So sometimes you want holiness or growth in virtue to develop in the magnificent, the splendors, but the reality is it happens in the ordinary, the mundane, the everyday. So it's by being attentive to our duties, religious and otherwise, 
that we can grow in virtue. The spiritual life we call it the purgative way. Sometimes mm -hmm. we don't feel it. Sometimes we'd, we'd rather be a thousand other places than where we need to be or called to be. And yet we fulfill our duties, we are faithful. That's the development of virtue, the growth in holiness. And by doing that in our everyday life, when suffering does come, we've mm -hmm. disciplined our wills, cooperated with grace, so we're more prepared for suffering. Just before we go, how long did it take you to put this book together? Uh, a few weeks. Most of it came from uh, preaching and teaching at my parish. I see. Okay. And when do you write when you put it together? Did you just provide, present that to Tan, or did you put it together yourself first? Put it together with some ideas, and then the publishers had a few thoughts, and we right. kind of adjusted. And okay. Another book in the works? So. or? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a actually reflected on the related to the series, uh, the Christian way. Oh, great! Okay. There's a book called "Sanctify Them in Truth" on on moral issues. Okay, right. we'll look forward to that, and you can make sure you stop by the next Sounds time good. you're in town to Thanks do so. that. Thank you, Father Jeffrey Kirby. Manual for Suffering. Boy, can we use it? Published by Tan. Available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. All things Catholic. Thank you so much for joining us right here on EWTN's Bookmark. Thanks. <laughs>